on the news today. So let's do that. And that should do it. And, okay. And, all right, I think I'll just go here for the moment. So, we have enough time for a few news things here, and there are a lot of good ones. This one is very interesting and relevant to this class. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, very relevant stuff. That's a whole bunch I saw just today. That's not working out so well. That's actually in the other class. What's that? Well, apparently so. Apparently that is real. I thought maybe that was a fake website, the Taiwan Bikini Climber. But apparently this is really true. You did a lot of selfies like this and she managed to fall off. I, I saw something, I saw stuff over here that seemed so insane and hard to be fake. It made me think this was a fake website like The Onion, but I think this is real. And so I know I've heard a few of these, uh, apparently in China especially, they have a bunch of these people that do selfies of them posing on the edge of a cliff and several of them have died. The edge of a building, stuff like that. It's apparently the, the new medium over there. Over here it's like drinking soap or bleach or something. They're, they have a word for that. <laughs> yeah. What is it? Kilty? Kilty. Kilty. Yeah, well, all right. Well, uh, I know um, a few years ago I heard about a Japanese um, custom where people kill themselves from overwork, and there's a special word for this kind of suicide, and it hit the news because about five years ago the government passed a special law that someone who kills himself from overwork is a traitor, and their, their widows will not get any uh, survivor benefit because they betrayed their company, which you know shows a they got a work ethic over there. <laughs> well, you know they got it. They got like the Protestants think they have work ethic, but the Japanese have work ethic. Anyway, um, work is important. So they, they, a case that brought up was a guy that had worked for the one year without a single day off, and 18 hours a day with like six hours a day of mandatory overtime, and he finally just killed himself. And they said that rotten bum, he shouldn't have done that. Anyway, so. <laughs> anyway, um, so there's this website, you can put it in your, you can put this browser extension in, it will tell you if the news site you're looking at is considered reputable, which I thought was pretty interesting. Uh, it likes this one. It gave Fox a pretty good rating. Because, um, you know, I must say I have had to do that too. I, I quit watching Bloomberg because they just make up lies. But Fox News is not always wrong. I mean, I, I didn't like it much because of their slant, but if you look at their ratings on this thing, they don't score that badly. There's a few things. They're not as um, as transparent as they should be, but they're considered good enough. I must say, they um, I try to hate them, but they're not always wrong, like Trump. I mean, There's anyway. No um, <laughs> what's that? It does not repeatedly publish false content. Right, right. I mean, they, they, they seem, they're trying to be taken seriously. I don't trust Bloomberg far more. I mean, Bloomberg made up this whole thing about uh, people putting hardware in network devices and never retracted it, even though they have no basis for it at all. But anyway, they scored pretty well too. Anyway, it's kind of interesting. Um, this is some attempt to try to do something about all the fake news. This one is particularly relevant to the students. And by the way, let me remember to mute all these folks and remind me with a chat message if I forget and you're irritated by each other's barking dogs and stuff, because that tends to happen. Um, anyway, so OSCP, several of my students are trying to get this. This is the most respected certification that penetration testers get, and yet, um, it apparently, I've heard this statement from several of my students took the exam, the machines you're attacking are really old. It's obvious that they have not updated the test in years. The point of this test and why it was so respected is it's not a multiple choice test. You have to really hack into so much machines and then you have to write a, a explanation of how you got in. So you have to really pen test machines, but they're really old. And this person says, cyber sick, that there are all kinds of underground forums where people just post the solutions because they haven't updated the stuff in years. So this person is going to post the solutions available to everybody and to shame them into updating the machines. And the OSCP people immediately responded by saying, this person is a bum and should be locked up and should be silenced. He said, well, that kind of is my point. What they have to do is update their stuff. Anyway, we'll see what comes of all this. Right now, people are screaming and yelling at each other about it, but it is interesting. Um, 
This certainly happened to all of your certification exams like uh, Cisco and Microsoft. You can totally just buy the answers online and so a bunch of people have the credential and don't know anything and that waters down the value of the credential. In general, employers know that if somebody has credentials, you don't really want to trust that unless you also see like classes or experience to back it up. If all they have is credentials and nothing else, they could very well have just cheated on the exam and that's what a lot of these boot camps do. Anyway, um, so this guy stole $10 million worth of IOTA, and I just thought I'd mention it because this is something I've heard a lot. You go to an online website, and he generates your secret key for you. And there are online websites that will generate passwords for you. And I say, who would use that? And wait, the end, this doesn't seem to be lighting up, making me think. My microphone is not right. It's using the internal microphone. How rude. Just a moment while I attempt to, aha, the cable's loose. That's, aha, now it's lit up good. All right, so that's remote viewers anyway so if anybody if you go to any kind of website that generates a password for you don't do it are you nuts because you just on the server you just logged the password generated for you made a common for you one for me <laughs> you you shouldn't be using an internet site to generate a secret anyway so this one is pretty good uh, this is a new kind of malware affecting Arabic speakers and it uses it has several good techniques interesting techniques it um, it's PowerShell based, and it can do a variety of backdoors. Some are custom DNS tunnels, and some going through Google um, shared files. And before doing anything else, it checks to see if it's running in a virtual machine or sandbox by doing WMI queries and running processes. Like I say, it's very easy to tell if you're in a virtual machine. You're often running something like VMware Tools. The name of the network card is something like VMware Simulated Network Card. It's actually pretty easy, and there are even some uh, add-ons you can put to try to disguise your virtual machine to make it less obvious that it's a virtual machine. But in fact, um, this is increasingly common that malware does check before running to see if it's in a virtual machine and not display its behavior then to thwart dynamic analysis, which is easy and powerful. But I mean, I'm teaching the malware analysis class. We talk about this dynamic analysis is sloppy, easy and powerful, but it would be pretty easy to avoid. And when the bad guys wise up, it's going to be a lot less useful. And we're getting there. The bad guys are wising up to how easy that makes it for us. And this is Bruce Schneier, who if you haven't read his stuff, he's very good. Go see his talks are very good. His blog is very good. His books are very good. He's one of the famous security guys like Dan Kaminsky, who is not only an expert, but also very good at communicating. So you do not need to be advanced to understand his talks. Um, and here's to talk about the evolution of dark nets, which is very interesting. You know, the Silk Road was on the dark net where you could only get there with the Tor browser. And then the FBI took it down and all those customers were just sort of lost, disassociated from merchants. until they put up another one and took it down, another one and took it down. And he's talking about how people are figuring this out. that If you put up an illegal marketplace, it will be taken down and then you'll lose access to your customers. And so they're trying to develop new techniques that will survive the takedown. And what they're saying is, Instead of having direct purchase through cryptocurrency, they're switching to other techniques like moving on messaging contacts through um, messaging programs to increase their customers, and then they're using dead drops to deliver the goods. Instead of trying to ship it through the post office or something, um, you just leave it in a public location, and then you tell them to go get it. And you could even put it there before you sell it. You just tell customers where it is, and this is the way spies have been doing it for decades. And yeah, yeah, and they're just talking about what they used to make it so that the actual motion of the money and the motion of the illegal product are concealed and kept away from anything that's easy for anyone to track. You know, they're moving into more and more sophisticated ways of doing it. So it's interesting to watch. Uh, and in that same spirit, there's just one more I want to mention, which is uh, ransomware. Ransomware was the number one attack last year. Now it's way down to 4%. It's gone from like 45% of all companies infected with ransomware down to 4%. The new hotness is crypto miners. Crypto miners infect your browser and mine a, a cryptocurrency. So it's running, using up a lot of CPU, and you clean it off, it stops, and the bad guy's already gotten some money. Whereas the ransomware, of course, they have to pop up a message, try to get you to pay it. Maybe you won't pay it. And um, anyway, the number two is mobile malware, almost all Android malware. So that gets us back to this class and we'll, uh, so anyway, now we're on the official clock here. Um, I should mention for starters that um, the project that was a zero day that I gave you last week has already been patched. That was uh, project nine. 
So if you did this last week, you could do it with the version in the Google Play Store, but you can no longer do it. They, I, I thought by the time it hit the major press, these guys were finally humiliated in the patchiness. So you can download the old version here. That old version is more than a year old. This has been vulnerable for years. I just went and got some old versions from one of the sites that archives old versions of Android apps, of which there are a ton. But anyway, then you can launch the old version and see that it exposes all your pictures. Um, I say this is something to be aware of in this class. Instead of using fake vulnerable apps, I'm using real company apps, and therefore they keep patching them as they get humiliated enough. Sometimes by this class is why they patch them because they get tired of being used as homework. Anyway, um, but a lot of them are shameless enough to just leave their junk broken for years and years, and I can give them for homework for years and years at DEF CON and everywhere, and they just seem utterly invulnerable to the humiliation. Uh, so that's convenient for me anyway. All right, so let's um, go through the first chapter here, which is here. Okay. All right. And here's the game. I'm going to make it big. Okay. So um, mobile OS. There used to be a variety of mobile operating systems, and there isn't any more. There's nothing but Android and iOS and all the rest has changed. Just this week, Microsoft officially announced they're giving up. They're throwing in their marbles and going home. No more Windows Mobile. They're just, they struggled and struggled and they can't get anywhere. <laughs> they never got up to like 1% of the market because their product was just never worth much compared to these. It wasn't as, it wasn't a lot better or a lot cheaper. And that's what you have to do when you walk into a field that somebody else already owns. But anyway, that's what happened. They gave up. Other people were around like BlackBerry and Palm Pilot long ago, but not anymore. Android more popular than iOS, but it's almost 50-50. Now it's like 55-45, Android and iOS. So then the issue is if you have a mobile device, which normally we call a phone because it's usually a phone, but it could be a tablet or something else. Um, so here's your attack service. These are all the vulnerable ways to attack it. One obvious one is through the Wi-Fi. When you connect to shared Wi-Fi in a coffee house, which most of these things do automatically without even telling you, then of course, anybody can intercept that communication or inject communication because uh, you're often using unencrypted insecure channels. So that's obviously some risk there. Then we can just steal the phone entirely. This is a special risk that applies a lot less to these desktop machines, which is where a lot of people developed their security model back a decade or two ago when the main computing was these desktop machines and you could just lock the door and have a reasonable confidence that nobody's gonna physically take the device. That is emphatically no longer true. The, uh, uh, a couple of years ago, SFO, there was this article said the San Francisco airport has 50,000 lost laptops a year. And what they do is they just pile them on a pallet and they auction them off. They don't attempt to clean them or analyze them or anything. They're all full of hard drives, full of everybody's data. One of them's mine. I lost my laptop on an airplane like almost anybody. And, you know, it's, um, that this is an issue. They're going to just steal the whole device. And then what? Then you're going to wish you had really encrypted that whole device with something that the key was not stored in a label on the device or somewhere foolish. That's the only way you're going to know that data wasn't stolen. Mine was. My only secret is the gradebook, and it's encrypted with a password. That's why I didn't really care. I just got another laptop and kept going. Anyway, malicious apps on the phone are huge, especially if you have an Android device. Um, there's very few malicious apps for iOS, but there's a ton of malware for Android, and a ton of it's in the Google Play Store. And uh, there was a study that came out this week also showing that um, most of the, or some large portion of the VPNs in the Google Play Store are malicious. Either malicious or um, poorly designed. There was a study a couple of years ago showing like 80% of all VPNs don't work. Uh, they don't actually encrypt all the traffic. In particular, most of them fail to encrypt the DNS resolution. So they do encrypt some of the traffic, but not all the traffic. And you might say that is of some benefit, but it certainly is not what the customers expected or what they reasonably ought to expect. Anyway, then you've got all these other things. Near field communication, the short range uh, radio, used for things like Google Pay, which is supposed to, which is RFID, Bluetooth, the camera, the microphone, SMS, all these things are data flying into the device. And um, let's see, I have a chat message. Let me see if I can figure out how to get to it. All right. Uh, the sound is getting loud and then soft. Okay. Audio's on. Uh, all right. Hopefully it's getting better. This was at 610. Then I found a problem at microphone. Let me know if it's still bad. But I switched to my better microphone, so hopefully you'll have better sound. I know that's the weak spot with my amateur uh, recordings here. 
So here's what the textbook authors found. 92% of apps have lack of binary protection. I certainly verified that independently. I'll show you the research I did over the last several years. Almost every app is, is trivially available to let you read the source code and modify it. Uh, it is possible to prevent that, but almost nobody bothers. I don't know why. Um, then a lot of them leak sensitive data by putting it in a log or somewhere foolish, have hard-coded passwords, permit injection from other apps on the phone, send the data over the network in an insecure way, such as plain text or with broken HTTPS, or store it foolishly on the device. Uh, I must say, I, I, I think I found about 60% of the retail apps I tested stored secrets insecurely on the device. It is amazing. Um, and it is abundantly clear that the app developers have no idea about security. They don't have any idea they're doing anything wrong. And apparently no one in the management at any of the companies that hire these app developers has any clue that anything is wrong either. Apparently there is no security audit anywhere by anyone even remotely competent. Uh, my impression is, although I do not have any direct inside knowledge, that all they do is look at the app to see if it looks pretty and test it to see if it works as intended for normal customers, and then they pay the bill and call it a success. And they do not have anything where they test it for security because this stuff is blindingly obvious and we'll be finding it. Um, anyway, so the, the primary problem here is developers don't even know anything about security, so they do what they think is a good job. They do what they would have learned in a class and got an A for. They make a beautiful app that's fast and and lets the legitimate users log in and do things, and then they call their job done. They don't realize they're doing anything wrong. It is, of course, very difficult for them to be up with security because security, as you can see, is big. There are many classes and books full of it. Um, and they, here's another one that's becoming more and more of a problem is supply chain threats. If you use a language like PHP or Python, you're actually using libraries written by many other people, and a lot of those are really old. And you don't even know it. So uh, there was another news article today about one of the major PHP code repositories got compromised weeks ago and nobody noticed. And it was serving up modified malicious versions of the custom libraries that everybody's using. And you're often using many layers of custom libraries. A library you install is actually using something else, using something else. So you're using stuff written by somebody 10 years ago in some foreign country, abandoned, that's been sitting somewhere on some server that somebody compromised long ago and put malware on and you'll never know. That's why you know it's, uh, that's, that's, the dark, that's the dark side of open source. Your open source stuff is just layers of stuff from God knows who, from who knows how old, thrown together. Yeah. You're about custom uh, well, even if you write a custom app, you typically use libraries. And the libraries are these inherited from the past. And unfortunately, since um, people get tired and quit, then often the libraries get compromised and nobody knows. And one thing I've read in the news in the last month or so is if you write a popular library or a popular browser extension, criminals will contact you and offer to pay you to um, buy it from you so they can put malware. So that's, uh, that's another threat model. Yeah. What does the book in chapter one mean when it says server side vulnerabilities pose a risk to local apps because they expose you to access to back end systems? Yeah. Um, we'll, uh, well, we'll talk, we'll get there, but I mean, the server side vulnerabilities are the web app vulnerabilities. That's the most important vulnerability that affects most people is not actually on the phone or in the app. It's the server being configured incorrectly. And that means all the data you send up can be stolen from the server. So I mean, that's where most of the actual data gets stolen on servers. This is why one thing a lot, of custom, a lot of students tell me is, I don't use online banking, so I'm safe. And I say, well, that might prevent some attacks, but in fact, the most likely thing is they'll hack into the bank and steal the whole list. And then the fact that you're not using online banking will not save you. So that's the issue. The, the servers are repositories of a lot of data and they, are, they really should be protected a thousand times more strongly than an individual app and they are not. So there's just breach after breach after breach of huge databases on the web and that's really a shame and it's beyond our control really. How is that specific to mobile versus the It's not, it's not. Yeah, and that's that. And you could say, so I, so I suppose one could argue they shouldn't call that a mobile vulnerability, but that is, right. it is a uh, a threat that affects you when you use mobile devices. Yeah. Yes, even if you just went into the bank and wrote on a piece of paper to make an account, they then type it into a computer and it gets stolen off that computer. So, so you know. Place for your information in a separate server. Yeah. 
Exactly. The only thing the only thing not using online banking does is mean they can't steal it off your phone or off the Wi-Fi network near you. But that is not the most common way they steal it anyway, because they steal them one by one that way. That's for punks. The pros hack into the server and steal the whole thing. So, you know, it's like uh, it's like sticking people up in an alley and taking what's in their wallet as opposed to robbing a bank. The second is much more profitable. And the defenses, unfortunately, are not comparable. The reason why they don't rob banks is because banks have security guards and vaults and everything. And the online servers don't really. They're not very secure at all. Um, many of them. So here we are. This is the OWASP Mobile Top 10. OWASP is an open source group. Almost every company belongs to it. It's very popular. Our students staffed the OWASP booth at RSA a few years ago, and everybody, they should use recruit new members, but everybody that came by was already a member. They all love OWASP. They're, they all volunteer their time to it. Microsoft and Google and everybody has representatives in OWASP, and they meet and decide what are, they do many things. They write code libraries you can download and use to improve your security. They write vulnerable things you can do to practice, and they publish these top 10 lists, which are highly valued. So here's the top 10 mobile risks. The first one is arguably not even right. It's on the server, not on the phone. The fact that the server is misconfigured is probably the main risk to your data, actually. Therefore, there's nothing you can do on your phone to protect you. But this is probably the biggest risk to the data. And then there's these other ones, which we'll go through. Notice M10 is the one I mentioned before, lack of binary protections. That is exposing the source code of an app so it can be modified. And it is the most common. It is considered the least severe because in itself, it doesn't uh, typically expose data. But it does mean that you can make a counterfeit app or a modified app, and it will run. And it does mean that whatever techniques they were hoping to keep secret are not kept secret very well because I can read the source code. So it is a risk. And it's very common, but it's considered a relatively low risk. So number one is top server side controls. It's so important. We got a whole class just in this. And this class exists because the NCC group people said they wanted us to teach this class. They said this is what people really need to protect web apps. And, they, um, and they're hiring a lot of students that finish this. I think three of our students are working there now. And they say when you try for the job, they make you take a CTF. Of kind of like this, because this is where it's at. You learn how to use Burp. This is written by the book is written by the guy that made Burp, and we're going through that. You learn how to test for many, many flaws on web servers, and almost all web services have a bunch of these flaws, and you need people that are good at finding them, or you get hacked. And when people get hacked at companies, you steal millions of records, and they find that very embarrassing, so they tend to actually do something about it. So um, then we get to the actual flaws that are on the phone. Insecure data storage, or you store the data on the phone, private data in some place where it's easy to steal. Uh, you don't transmit it well. You use plain text transmission or you use invalid HTTPS certificates or other flaws. And then there's leakage where you let the data leave your app and your supposedly protected directory and leak off somewhere else through sloppy coding like putting it in the log. The log is available to every app on the phone. So it's not a safe place to put data. Some apps put data on the SD card which is also available to every app on the phone because you're supposed to be putting things like photographs on the SD cards. You can move them to another device. It's not a place you should be doing passwords or secrets because it's not in the control of the app anymore. Then there's failure in authorization and authentication. Uh, this is true, especially of Internet of Things devices. Um, they do not really keep track of who you are properly. This is a very common flaw also of home routers. A lot of small devices, don't actually bother to maintain a session state properly and have you log in first, record who you are, and then every time you try to do something, compare your permissions to see if you're authorized to do that. Instead, they do something sleazy, like have an administration page in a folder with a non-obvious name and just have a link to it that you only see after you've logged in. So if you have, um, that's one they call insecure direct object access. Anybody could in fact use the administrator control, but they hope you won't find it unless you log in first. This is not really protecting it. It's just hiding it like a key under the mat. They're hoping you won't look under there. And that's one of the many types of failures you have here where you do not actually check to make sure you know who people are all the time and make sure that they're authorized to do what they're doing all the time. Then broken cryptography, tons of this. People actually implement cryptography, but they do it stupidly so it doesn't really protect you. Correctly executed cryptography is your most powerful security control. The math is very well developed. If you actually use something like AES or RSA correctly, nobody is getting in there. Snowden wanted to leak NSA secrets, and he wanted to leak them using PGP encryption because he knew that the NSA can't even get in PGP encryption if you use it correctly. But it's almost impossible to use correctly. People don't. 
and the apps do stupid things. So many of them use AES, use it foolishly, and it doesn't protect you at all. We'll do that in the projects. Um, and then client-side injection. This is the one we can get into this semester that I have not been able to do in previous semesters because I've got Drozier. That's why I got this book. This book is written by the author of Drozier, your new textbook. Uh, Drozier is an Android um, penetration testing platform. And the purpose of it is you install an agent on the phone. And now that app is under your control. And you can use that app to attack the other apps on the phone, which is what malware authors do. They get you to install malware. Then the malware tries to steal the data from the other apps. I wasn't able to do that before. But now with Drozier, we can do that. And we're checking for flaws like this, client-side injection. These attempt to put malicious activities in the signals from one app to another on the phone. And vulnerable apps are susceptible to that. Uh, then there's inter-process communication, a similar issue. Different processes on the phone can talk to each other. And um, security decisions via untrusted inputs is common because uh, this is related to the Linux server flaws of, tr of our login and such. Once you've logged into one server, you can often connect to another and it trusts you. It thinks it knows who you are. So you might trust some signal that comes from another app as sufficient evidence that this person is authorized to do something, but it might be that that other app should not be trusted to the extent you're trusting it. Then session handling is another issue. You have to somehow keep track of who people are. This is typically done with something like an authorization cookie, but if you let people steal the authorization cookie, it doesn't work, and we'll see this a lot in web apps and also on the phone. And we've already talked about lack of binary protections. That's what I had last time, where you can just see the source code and modify it to make a counterfeit Trojan version of the app. So OWASP makes these vulnerable um, frameworks. I'm asked to secure iOS apps, Goat Droid, and so on, deliberately insecure apps for practice, um, and various other ones for practice. These are the ones I've used occasionally. So far, I'm not using them in this class, although we will use one for the inter-process communication um, with uh, the new attack tool, because I haven't yet found real apps that are vulnerable to attack from other apps. After I get good at it, I'm planning to go through and test many companies, and we'll probably find a bunch of real apps with that vulnerability. But when I get to tell you that this semester, we'll have to do it like secretly, because I do have to give them 30 days to ignore me before I make them homework. But I would be surprised if we make it to the end of the semester and do not find several real apps that are vulnerable to these new attacks. I just didn't know enough to test them a few years ago when I started in this. So, but I did do this stuff. Um, so I checked banks, insurance companies, and stockbrokers, and medical apps, and retailers. These are the ones I've tested in previous years and talked about at DEF CON and such. And many of them were led to these projects. So I tried all the top 10 banks. Most of them are very vulnerable. Chase wasn't. They actually, rather, Chase actually fixed it, but they're all vulnerable to code modification. That's the main one here. Some of them were also using insecure data transmission. None of them were so bad as to actually use plain text transmission, but some of them did send data um, with broken HTTPS, where you could use a forged certificate and it would accept it. That is very common. It's, in my experience, that's about 15% of Android apps allow that, and uh, maybe 5% of iOS apps. Um, stock brokering apps were fantastically bad, similar, and TD Ameritrade was the very worst that actually put your password in the log, in addition to doing other things. And uh, they took them about two years, but they finally fixed it. And when I tried to use them this semester for homework, as I have done for years in the past, they actually finally patched their app. So when you try to run the old version, it'll not let you run the old version anymore. So they eventually get tired of being humiliated. About two years, two years of being the bad example in all my pro classes, eventually they get fed up with it. And they wise up to what the NFL figured out five years ago, that you can, when it, you turn on an app, the server can ask your app, okay, what's your signature? Wait, you're not the official app I like. I'm not going to do anything. I'm going to pop a message saying you must update your app. Your app is out of date. I'm not talking to you until you fix it. That would fix this M10 vulnerability. Why do you accept a counterfeit app? Why don't you ask and only talk to an app that really is correctly signed by your company. This doesn't seem like it's asking too much, but none of these people bother. The NFL bothers them. Anyway, and all they're doing is selling t-shirts. But they got humiliated because they were doing everything wrong and a security researcher published the NFL app is sending plain text passwords and everything. So then they apparently hired a competent security engineer to audit their app and they made it much more secure than any of these apps. The insurance companies are also vulnerable. Um, 
and off you go. I gave Geico a small improvement here because they actually have a way to report a vulnerability. Almost none of these people have any way to tell them they have an insecurity. Um, although I know from private communication from people in secret that they did in fact hear my reports, but they wouldn't talk to me at all. So I have no way to know they heard my reports. Geico had a vulnerability page, but they didn't patch the vulnerability. And then there's the retail apps, Home Depot. These are ones stored at reversible encryption. They'll be doing these in the uh, projects. Um, these people store your password in the apps directory with AES, and then they hide the key on the phone where you can just totally find it. And so what was the point of that? This is, I don't know why they bother encrypting at all when they don't, but it, apparently some, the developers figured out that just not using encryption at all is bad. So we'll just pretend to use encryption or apparently they don't understand what real encryption is and none of their, so here is do either. So they just sort of do something that makes it look like they've encrypted it and that passes. This is a uh, security theater. That's what Bruce Schneier talks about it. When you pretend to make things secure, for example, the TSA, the TSA primarily checks to make sure they know who you are when you get on a plane. And as Bruce Schneier explains in his book, I don't care who you are. All I care about is, do you have a bomb? Knowing who you are is not benefiting anybody. <laughs> And comparing you to some list of who shouldn't be getting on the plane is also complete garbage because that list is just names. It's not even the right people. That whole security theater, it's just an expensive government bailout of the airline industry. It is pretending to secure you when in fact it's not stopping the threat, but it's making it look like you've done something. And that's mainly what apps do. They throw in some encryption so it looks like they encrypted the stuff, but they don't actually encrypt it, which is a shame because it's not hard to actually use encryption correctly. And if you do, it'll actually stop attacks, but that's not what they do. So I have some hoots about that stuff. Bring those up. Look in here. All right. All right. And it should be, I guess this will do right there. Okay. I should be able to turn up the music. And I think I fixed my settings. My cahoots were always having the first one be right. And I know you'd be very disappointed if that continued. No. I think I got that set fixed last night. We'll notice. If the first one's right every time tonight, then I didn't make it. I'm going to bring up a page to store this stuff in. All right. And it is one twenty-three. Okay. All right. Guess I'll wait another few seconds. Okay, still people coming. All right, five more. Looks like that's it. Okay. All right, what's the most popular OS? Okay, Android. I it's uh, now has never been number one. I think and it's always been Android, but the gap is narrow. We're down to a two horse race these days. What's the most common vulnerability? All right. Good. Okay. All right. So that's it. Lack of binary protections. So what's the largest security problem? Most important. All right. 
it's the servers. The servers are the big problem. Um, all right. And if an app puts passwords in the syslog, which phone would OWASP call back? That's it. That's, it's not data storage. You don't store data in the log and then get it back. That'd be a database or something. It's leakage. It's putting data in some foolish place where you shouldn't be putting it. All right. Let me record the winners. And it uh, looks like all of these are fake names, so people will have to tell me who they are if they want points. You're pink. Okay, good. All right. Um, and uh, Lull. Lully is your last name. Good. Okay, good. Good. This looks like a fake name, but it ain't good. All right. And K is K. Oh, good. Okay, good. Uh, Carla, right? Okay, good. Good. Then I have real names. Life is good. So um, that's enough of the chapter. And let me just say a few words about the projects. I don't know if it's... Um, we've talked, I think, about... Last time I saw people doing the plain text log in here, um, and that's fine. Uh, we'll get burp and look at broken SSL pretty soon. I think we'll do that next time. I just want to say a little bit about the Drozer app that I talked about. That's project 10. We're not there yet, but we'll get there. But let me just talk about how this goes. We're going to use Kali. So what I'm actually doing, you can do it a variety of ways. I'm actually using a virtual box Jenny motion machine and a VMware Kali machine and got them talking to each other. Now, you could put it all in VirtualBox, and that'd be all right. You could actually have two physical computers. There are many ways to do it. But the modern version of VirtualBox actually lets you choose different, um, different ways to network. So let me bring this up so I can demonstrate this somewhat confusing technique. So as you know, you start your Jenny motion, and you launch your phone. You've been, you've done this in the first and second project. Now here... I'm going to get this message, and you'll get this message after you do this project. Because I have connected my phone to VMware, it won't start without VMware running. So it's complaining. However, notice it says, to find the problem, start it from VirtualBox. This is an important fact to know. If you launch your phone from Jenny Motion, you are using VirtualBox, but you can't see VirtualBox. And not all the VirtualBox features are available. So this is my Google Pixel 3 that would not start from Jenny Motion. If you want to find out what's really going on with the Google Pixel 3, you have to start VirtualBox, and down here it is, the Google Pixel 3. And now you can adjust settings. And Android net, I mean, VirtualBox networking is very confusing. Students have been suffering the red versus blue projects and other ones. If you go to network, the way Jenny Motion works, you have an, an a host only adapter. And that one always has this address, which I guess isn't showing here, but it's always uh, 192.168.56.101, I think. And that is the one that controls the phone through Jenny Motion. You can't change this adapter or Jenny Motion will quit working. So the way to connect it to another network is to enable a second adapter. And you can send this adapter to various places. Um, all right. And I thought I had it going to the um, VMware adapter, but it's looking kind of funny here. Um, anyway, I'm not going to worry about it right now. Let me start my VMware. Let's see if I've got it set up. Here's my VMware. <coughs> and once VMware is started, I should be able to start that phone from Jenny Motion. And the phone now has two adapters, one going to the control for Jenny Motion and one going to the VMware network. All right. So here's my phone, and all right. Now, by the way, you can sweep up from the bottom supposedly to start your phone. In fact, I have no luck doing that at all. I made it work like once, and after that, it just doesn't work. I use this button down here that gets you to start your phone. Then I can log in with my secure password. Not that secure, it's one, two, three, four. Okay, and now if you look at the network settings, I put settings here, which I recommend, because you need to adjust it all the time for what we're doing in this class. And here settings, oh, there they are. 
Okay, network. Oh boy. Looks like one of my apps, like a sports app is freaking out. Oh, no battery left. I am charging. It's, wait, look at this. Wow, so it's totally freaking out. He's launching copy after copy of a sports app, which I loaded. Neat, looks like my phone has pretty much crashed on me. Yeah, there it goes. Thanks so much, Hey, good. All right, anyway, um, the, uh, this by the way is pretty common. Especially now, in my earlier version, if you used a really old version like Android 4.4, it seemed to work pretty well. The latest version seems to crash a lot. But anyway, I can usually keep it up long enough to get my job done. You do have a reboot now and then, though. All right. And uh, that was some app, this S app. So I think that's the sports app. I, I loaded a sports app to test it called uh, Team Score or something. Anyway. Um, so let's see if it's going to stay up long enough for me to get the IP address out of here, which is what I was going for. Network and internet. Wi-Fi. And Android Wi-Fi here. And now if you go to advanced, it will show you. I've got 147, 144, 219, 197. So it is, in fact, bridged to the City College Network which is not the way you set it up for Drozer. There you set it to the uh, virtual network for your, your colleague machine. But you can control it from VirtualBox here. And the thing I wanted to show you is if you go into VirtualBox and go to the second network adapter, leave the first, you can actually point to almost anything here. You can go out the bridge, the uh, wireless network, you can go through the USB Ethernet, and you can go to either the VMNet network for NAT or for uh, host only. <coughs> so Android, so VirtualBox is now smart enough to talk to a VMware virtual network. So the two can talk to each other. This did not used to be true. Anyway, um, that's an issue when you try to set up these devices. But for this project, what I did was connect Kali, use Drozer on Kali. And Kali can use most of our classes. So now you've, you connect it and you install an agent on the phone with ADB. You push the agent from Kali onto the phone and install it. And now on your phone, you'll have this Drozer agent as an app. And the Drozer agent is the phone app that is going to be remote controlled by Kali. And so you start a server here, turn it on, and now it's a server controlled by Kali. And now you can use the Drozer agent to send signals to other apps on the phone which is just what bad guys would do by tricking you to installing something nasty like a fake VPN client or something. Then they can try to use that client to steal data from the other apps on the phone. And that's what Drozer simulates. And supposedly, a ton of apps are vulnerable to this. And I'll let you know when I find real ones. Right now, I'm just doing the sample ones they give us with a known vulnerability. And we'll do those. But uh, as soon as I get good and fast at this, I'll try doing many, many apps and see how many of the top 10 banks, insurance companies, stockbrokers, and retailers and everything are vulnerable. And I would expect a lot of them are because they haven't even tested the simple stuff I taught in previous semesters, like SSL connections. So I highly doubt they're testing for any of this. But this is Drozer. It launches this page and gives you a page sort of like Metasploit where you can now try attacks on your phone. And uh, you can now launch various forms of attacks here. And we're going to do a series of attacks that attack vulnerable applications from another app on the phone which is pretty cool, and uh, will get us to the next level of Android security testing. Anyway, I think that's enough. You should, all have, um, you should all have an account and be taking quizzes. So make an account on this server here, and you should be taking quizzes before each class. And uh, starting in, and when you do your homework, the scores will end up there. Most of the homework here comes in the screenshots and is graded by hand by my grader, but some of them are actually automatically graded. Um, if you look at 128 projects, uh, yeah, the ones with asterisks will automatically go into the, uh, the Canvas. So if you have not made a Canvas account, you won't be able to record your score. That happened to a couple students in some of my other classes. They jumped to the projects and didn't take any quizzes first. Anyway, so let me know if you have any troubles. I'm just going to clean up and go up to the lab. I'll help anybody that wants to work tonight. Uh, all right. I'm going to stop the share. And if anybody needs an ad code, let me know. I've got them. Okay, uh, let me stop this and uh, I'll bring up the ad code.